Assalamu alaikum, hello and welcome to The Health Show here only on the Islam Channel with me, Alastair Greener. As you know by now, every week we're joined by a health expert within their specialised field and discuss the prevention of health issues or concerns that we or our loved ones may face. Looking at how you can change your health and lifestyle for the better, The Health Show offers an alternative viewpoint from the health experts who attend the show to help guide you in the right direction. And as always, if you'd like any further information about our programmes or any of the topics that we discuss, then please do get in touch. Health Show at IslamChannel.tv. Today, we're looking at fistulas affecting women in poor countries. Fistulas are usually caused by injury or by surgery, but they can also result from an infection or an inflammation. We're welcoming today Khalid Javid from the UK, and he is the director of Physicians Across Continents. Uh, Physicians Across Continents, if you're not familiar with them, they are an international medical humanitarian organisation that provides high-quality medical care, teaching and training to individuals and communities affected by crises worldwide. Halid, lovely to see you. Thanks for joining us. Thank you very much, Halid. It's nice to be here. We've got lots to talk about today, but before we do that, let's tell you a little bit about fistulas. Obstetric fistulas affect around 2 million of the world's poorest women and is widespread in West Africa and the nations around there, for example, Niger, which has the highest birth rate in the world. The condition is caused by complicated labour and also causes chronic incontinence, often leaving the victims as social outcasts. Let's take a look at this report. They live in a country with the highest birth rates in the world. And at this centre in Niger, many women are suffering the consequences of birth complications. They've just been treated for obstetric fistula, which leaves victims with chronic incontinence and often results in them becoming social outcasts. I've suffered too much. I lost my stillborn child. My husband left me. I almost died. In a country with little access to health care, women can be in labour for days, the pressure of the baby's head cutting off blood supply from delicate tissues. The mothers are often young and physically unprepared for labour, and the baby often dies. Yet this could all be avoided with a caesarean section. There's a lack of support for pregnancy in this country. So most women don't receive prenatal consultations. The average woman in Niger gives birth to as many as seven children. A third of girls are married before the age of 15 and three quarters before they turn 18. On voit souvent les, les petites filles mariées. We often see young girls married simply because of tradition or to avoid being seen badly after an unwanted pregnancy. Neither girls nor boys go to school. We use the children instead to do household chores. Hadjura was married at 12 years old. Falling pregnant soon after, she lost her baby in labour. Since I arrived, I feel a bit better. I see other women here and that comforts me. These women are among the lucky ones, having received surgery to treat their condition. But women with fistulas are often shunned by their communities, who believe they've been punished for witchcraft or adultery. So survivors are encouraged to speak up for other victims, sticking together to fight a preventable curse. I mean, that's a fascinating report, but it's, it's really disturbing, isn't it, that such a thing can be so widespread. Why is it so widespread in this particular part of the world? Well, Alistair, it's, it's, it's a condition which normally affects uh, the poorer nations in, in the world. So you have Africa and Asia. Um, it's relatively eliminated in the UK. This is why a lot of people do not know about this. Uh, so UK, Europe uh, and the Western countries, America, um, because... Most of the women have a birth, it's say, in hospital, so it can be picked up, can be dealt with there. But one of the major conditions, or causes for this, rather, is malnutrition. Um, and the second cause, if it's obstetric fistula, which is a, a prolonged childbirth, 
is the person delivering the child has not been qualified enough. Because in the developing countries, you have six out of 10 people who are not qualified enough to deliver a child. So that's causing all sorts of problems, not only for the child, um, for the mother at the same time as well. And we saw there the, the, the effects that it has yes. long term. It's not, this isn't just a medical issue. This is something that, as we saw, where women become effectively thrown out of the family unit and, you know, her, horrendous experiences for those women. Well, well they, it comes to two, twofold, basically. Um, we've had cases uh, that we've dealt with uh, that the normal practice of things, what happens is one, once this condition has developed in such a long time, because unfortunately the women cannot control their bodily functions, mm -hmm. uh, be it urinating or be it feces. It depends on what type of uh, obstetric fistula uh, the woman has developed, uh, be it one from the bladder or be it one from the rectum. Um, sometimes it's both, sometimes it's only one. Um, but the husband normally divorces the wife uh, because she's constantly smelling. Uh, and then obviously, as the video showed, uh, how they become a social outcast because the children are taken off there because she seemed to, she's perceived to be constantly dirty. Uh, without a fault of her own, uh, obviously. And I suppose there's a lot of, you know, the lack of knowledge and the lack of education and what's happening. Yeah, of course, this is, this is it. Uh, and um, so we have that issue, but then the whole society abandons a woman because we, we just had a, a report because we're out in the field doing these operations. Uh, we found a 60-year-old woman. She's been living in isolation for 30 years. Wow. By herself in a little confined room. So if the viewers can just imagine living in your bedroom, no one seeing you, no one touching you, no one talking to you for 30 years. Um, we've done the operation. Um, after 30 years living in a condition. Let's get back to the real basics of this. So first of all, what exactly is a fistula? You have, uh, well, a fistula is, is a vessel and it's a hole between two vessels. So when you said um, uh, it's a result of an operation, or it can be a result of, of a injury or condition. So for example, say you've got your veins mm -hmm. uh, and then like you have a hole in between it, that's a fistula. Uh, so it's a hole between two vessels. Uh, obstetric fistula is the pregnancy one. So you have a rupture in the bladder or you have a rupture in the rectum um, due to a prolonged birth. And this is something that you, you were saying that we don't have here in the West because it's picked up upon, you know, in other words, we get them still, late women get them here, but they're just picked up straight away, dealt with straight away, so therefore it never becomes an issue. Yeah, of course, in, in, like in, in hospital. So, so if the, someone does have this condition in hospital, uh, it's seen, it's dealt with, it's fixed, uh, and the woman can live a perfectly normal life. And is it something that actually is fairly common? It's just the fact that it's dealt with so quickly, it's never something that people need to um, concern themselves with. In the West, not so much, um, because the nutrition of the woman, because she's taking her vitamins uh, and they're a lot more healthier and the bodies are stronger, uh, she, she doesn't go through this. And secondly, uh, the person who's delivering the child uh, is uh, acutely trained. So. Uh, what we take into account is two things. Number one, uh, if the labour is too long and it's uh, too difficult, then a C-section will happen. But in the developing countries, they haven't got that option. So it's constantly uh, like uh, uh, grieving and constantly pushing and constantly... It's just pain. It's just pure pain. Uh, and obviously, you know how the women <laughs> always say to us, only if you could give birth, you'll <laughs> understand uh, what it is. Uh, but... But obviously, in these countries, they're going through a whole different experience. And obviously, the, you know, we, we spent some time, um, I'm sure, hopefully our viewers may have seen the time that we spent in uh, Uganda last year, where we saw the conditions of many of these hospitals mm -hmm. are just extremely basic. No, of course. And obviously, if a few viewers did watch it, that's the one when you run out the operating theatre <laughs> three times. Yeah, yeah, you'll have to watch that another time, everyone. Yeah, yeah, got me there. You know, you can't hide from anything here. Um, <laughs> But what that highlighted was the conditions that the physicians are working under, not just physicians across continents, mm. but obviously local physicians, yes. where in that particular incidence where there was no electricity because there'd been a, a power cut, the equipment was pretty basic in the first place. Mm -hmm. 
So a lot of chemicals are having to be used just to overcome the cleanliness issues and so on. I mean, it, it's incredibly challenging for doctors over there. So how can the doctors and you know, charities such as yourself help with the education so that these things are spotted and therefore dealt with so these women don't have to go through this? Uh, Alistair, what it comes down to is just training. Um, as I mentioned previously, six out of ten uh, midwives, as, as we call them, uh, in the developing countries, they're not trained to an adequate level to deliver a child. Uh, so th there's a three-facet approach in tack tackling obstetric fistula. Uh, number one is the nutrition for the woman. Um, so she has her regular vitamins, she eats properly, she drinks fluid, very important. Uh, secondly is for the people delivering the child, they have more training and they're acutely aware of other situations, be it is the child upside down or how do we, develop, uh, how do we del deliver this child. Uh, and then thirdly, it's for the woman in itself, uh, if she does develop this uh, problem, is picking it up, understanding it and getting the operation done. Because in 2016, I won't mention what country it is, is in North Africa, there was 315,000 reported cases. The Royal Physician Colleges of London, uh, they've estimated that only 15% of this figure is reported. Wow. So now we can see how many people in one country this is. Uh, and then, like, like you said earlier on, the 2 million, only 15% uh, by a figure um, by the uh, physicians over here. Um, and then in that one year, they only done, because of the resources, 235 operations. So 235 operations with a condition which is affecting 600,000 people it's tip of the iceberg, isn't it? It's not even tip of the iceberg. I want to come back to the nutritional side of things because you said, again, here in the West, the nutrition is at such a level where mm. this doesn't become an issue. Yes. So what is it that's predominantly creating the problem from a nutritional standpoint? Well, firstly, fundamentally, they don't have enough to eat. So they can't sustain them, their, their own strength and their own body, and then the child can't um, have his or her nutrition uh, adequately what she needs or they need. Uh, secondly, it's is your basic vitamins that you need to take, uh, your, your folic acids um, for the development of the child as well. Um, over here, you, you go and see your uh, GP, you go and see your uh, doctor, and they'll say, take this medication, take this medication, do this, do this, do this, and so forth. And, and because obviously the, the, uh, the female body through pregnancy is going through uh, a huge amount and obviously sure. the requirement for those nutrients for the unborn child is incredibly important. So you're, that, you're feeding, course. you know, the old thing of you're feeding two, yeah. but literally you need enough nutrients for, for, two, for two bodies. But they haven't even got enough nutrients for one. Mm. Uh, so so we, we, we can see, and this, this is something paramount, uh, especially in developing countries, uh, the mother would take the food out of her own mouth and give it to other mm. her, her, her other children, uh, where she's got an unborn child in her, uh, and she hasn't got strength to walk, she hasn't got strength to do anything, then she has to walk 10, 15, 20 kilometres uh, one way to get some water, and, and back as well. That's not good for her, and that's not good for the child. And actually, one of the things that's interesting is when we were filming in Bavuma Island um, in Uganda, we saw that where people are just travelling vast distances, yes. which, as you say, is, is not good for the uh, unborn child. Coming to the actual discovery, obviously this isn't something that's picked up yeah. by so many doctors, as you've said. So give me a, sort of a, a timeline from the birth through to when symptoms will... the woman will start noticing something's gone horribly wrong and this incontinence, as you said, begins. It's relatively quite quickly um, because now, if, if, like, like, if you imagine if you have a cut, uh, like you, you cut your hand, the blood will start trickling depending on how deep it is, then uh, as you move around a lot more, uh, it'll get bigger or it'll get more and more coming out. It's relatively the same thing. If you just imagine it's just an internal wound that has to be fixed, and the only way to fix it is via surgery. And what about the long-term consequences? Obviously, there's, there's massive social consequences. Mm -hmm. But what about the physical consequences? You know, if, if, a, um, you know, if there's incontinence and things like that, one assumes that she's losing even more nutrients or, or the very few that she has through all of this. 
on, on that side, I don't think they're too worried about that because they've been kicked out of society. So they have two options. Where over here, as I was mentioned to you before, we have a welfare system to look after people who are unfortunately sick. Africa, Asia, we haven't got that. Uh, so the woman relatively has two options. Um, one is to go into prostitution to survive. Uh, and then we, we, we see in some countries where you have the rise of prost prostitutes because they have no other option. Uh, and secondly, to commit suicide. That's, that's their life. They yeah. have nothing. So going back to what you asked uh, about the nutrition, it, it's just a slow, prolonged death. But the, 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 once you go into a country with physicians across continents, how easy is it to identify exactly what the problem is with a patient and how easily is it to actually treat this? It's relatively easy. Um, it, you need to do an operation. Uh, on the woman, you'll have to examine her first, um, be it uh, a bladder uh, rupture, be it a rectum rupture, or uh, depending on the level of the operation you have to do. Um, so, what really gives it away, and uh, unfortunately, this this is it, is the smell. Uh, and this is is not a, is not from the woman itself because she can't control. Yeah. If you cannot control it, you cannot control it. Um, so the doctors go in, uh, they examine. Uh, they comfort her, uh, firstly, because what this has as well, it has a physical impact, uh, as we've been discussing, but more long-term is, is, is the psychological impact. Of course, of course. But you say the actual treatment is fairly straightforward. So, for example, if you go in, you know, obviously forgetting the massive social and mental health issues mm -hmm. involved in this, but actually if you went in and you saw um, a woman who clearly had this condition and you were able to treat it, how quick is the recovery process? Okay, normally what we recommend, um, everyone has different... Uh, but normally the woman stays in hospital for about 15 days. Um, relatively less movements. I know here we say, as soon as you have an operation, get up, walk around and so mm -hmm. forth. Relatively less um, because it's very delicate. If you, if you imagine, uh, your, your bladder is like a balloon. So you're stitching up a balloon. Um, so any kind of like fast movements, physical movements. Or any form of pressure. Pressure, yeah. excursion. Um, you're going to have... It could rupture again. So you need about two weeks um, for laying, resting, relaxing. Um, and then, inshallah, God willing, um, the woman's fine. And I know you've been involved in seeing some of these surgeries taking place. And the, um, it, it must be an amazing thing to be able to effectively give a woman her life back. It's not, wow, well, it's, it's, it's everything back to her. Um, and like we had two cases uh, that was given to us. I mentioned the 60-year-old woman, but uh, the, the other reason why obstetric fistula can occur uh, is from the younger girls who are not developed and they get raped. And this happens all around the world, unfortunately. So one of the youngest cases we, held, we dealt with uh, last year was a six-year-old girl in I won't mention the name of the country and, and, and the girl for obvious reasons. Six-year-old girl, she, she was previously raped. Uh, the doctors were there uh, at, at the time and she got taken to hospital and they realised she had a, a double rupture. So she had a rectum rupture and she had um, a bladder rupture as well. Um, they operated on her um, and they were shocked in themselves because they've never done it on a six-year-old girl before. Six? Six. Wow. Um, but from the reports now, she, uh, it's, it's been a year and a half on. She seems perfectly fine. The psychological impact of the rape is one thing, but physically yeah. um, we, we've helped her. 
to get no, her life back No, we're going to talk a lot in the second half about physicians across continents and some of the work that you do and indeed the work uh, that you do with fishers. And we probably might mention a little bit of the coverage that we mm -hmm. here at the Islam Channel did of your work, which is just e extraordinary. But generally, how much is it a recognised problem by different health organisations who go in and, and help in these countries where they really struggle with their healthcare systems? Um, it's the untold story, if we look at it like that. Um, uh, the, 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 the amount of people this affects, um, because it's not only the individual, as we said, it's not only the woman, it's the children, it's the, it's the husband, it's the whole family at, at large. So the amount of people this affects is, is absolutely huge. Uh, but what, what it comes down to is you need to have a specialist team to go in to do that. And unfortunately, a lot of the charities uh, and a lot of the organisations haven't got that bank of um, qualified doctors, qualified physicians, um, because there's not only one. Uh, you need you, you need an, an, an anaesthetist, you, you need a surgeon, you, you need um, many, many different forms. You need the medication, you need the, the hospital, so it's, it's a logistic nightmare as well. And a massive part of this, again, is education, isn't it's, it? It's just so that people actually have an, an idea of what's happening so that maybe she won't be quite the social pariah that they're making her out to be because yeah. they'll have a better understanding of her condition. No, no there definitely is. But it's, it's extremely sad that, even in the 21st century, that we're talking about a condition mm -hmm. which can be fixed relatively quite easily. And we focused on, on Africa there with our video from Niger, but which are the other hot spots, sorry to use that term, but which are the other main um, areas of the world where this is a, a real problem? Well, it goes hand in hand with malnutrition. So where we look at malnutrition, you can find Officer Fischler. It's, it works hand in hand. And, and is it one of those things that also affects disaster areas? So, for example, when we see some of the terrible floods and landslides in Nepal and, uh, you know, in Bangladesh and these other countries where actually they're, they're not doing too badly, but then all of a sudden a disaster happens and then normal medical aid almost goes out the window because they're just surviving on a day-to-day -day basis. When a, when a disaster happens, everything just gets turned upside down. Mm. Um, but if, if it's a waterborne disaster, we're looking at... Um, conditions of cholera, typhoid, and so forth. Um, if it's an earthquake, um, you're going to have all, all, all different things uh, rupturing, uh, c coming through. Um, but with this condition as well, it, it's resulting in malnutrition. And secondly, it, it came, as, as I mentioned with, the, with that young, young girl, um, with rape victims. So in Bangladesh, there's a lot, a lot of Rohingya people at the moment. Yeah, of course. Um, who have been, uh, uh, who have gone through this whole process, um, and have got this condition, unfortunately. and Because I've just recently come back from there, and I haven't shown you any of the pictures, but there, there, there was one girl um, who got sent to me the other day. Alistair, she's got a black eye, like you wouldn't believe. She's been raped. And her foot has literally been sliced straight down the middle. So she can't get away, basically. Uh, but the foot has got such an infection uh, that it's grown to almost the size of an elephant foot. It's all def deformed and everything. And the trouble is we hear these tragic stories all too often. Yeah. Uh, we're going to take a break now, but when we come back, we're going to talk a little bit more about the work that you do and other charities and all this work, which is so vital. Mm -hmm. Sadly, it's not making a sufficient impact, but it is making a definite impact. Yeah. And we'll talk a little bit more about that after the break. So um, please do stay with us. But for now, we should stress that should you suffer from any medical problems or have any health concerns, it's always highly recommended that you contact your doctor or GP as the health show gives you an alternative viewpoint to the health concern being discussed. As I said, it's now time for a short break, but please don't go away. We've got lots more to talk about. Hello and welcome back to The Health Show, where our topic today is women's health. 
The Fistula Foundation states that fewer than six in ten women in developing countries give birth with any trained professional, such as a midwife or doctor. When complications arise, as they do in approximately 15% of all births, there is no one available to treat women, leading to disabling injuries like fistula and sometimes even death. So how can we get to the root of this problem? In Uganda, like so many other sub-Saharan African countries and Southeast Asian countries, the lack of education and access to proper maternal care results in many cases of urogenital fistulas, often leading to women's exclusion from their own communities. I don't even go anywhere, even a church, even where people are, I don't go because of this disease. I fear that people can laugh at me. Yes. Doctors are not enough for the country. So this woman delivered from the, they are deep in the villages without any med medical passion, so they end up getting the problems. Others, they dare to come to hospital because of money. The woman can start labeling. She fails to get transport to, to the hospital, ending up getting what? I mean, fascinating to watch. And again, like our first video, it shows what a huge problem this is. But the effect that it has is extraordinary. And one of the things that we talked a little bit about before was the lack of education. And it's the education amongst the medical community, but also amongst people generally, that people don't actually realise what's happening here. Yeah, of, of, of course. Uh, amongst medical communities, as you mentioned, and six out of ten just do not know how to deliver children correctly. Uh, and that can result in many complications. Um, but then the community at large is sad uh, because they, they're going with um, medieval pre-concepts and pre-ideas uh, that if, if a woman has this, she's been, um, like, say, in a lot of the African countries, it'll be, like, voodoo magic and so forth. She's been touched with this kind of stuff. So she's been possessed or she's dirty or, she, or these kinds of things. So th there's a lot of unfortunate culture uh, that goes with uh, conditions like and this. And it's very difficult to change people's minds when it's gone through the generations, that that's the fundamental problem. And, and what about the, 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 the physical health of the woman afterwards, she's obviously not being treated, so she, these fissures remain, mm. and she's having difficulty with continence and, and, and so on. What's the actual... The, we talked a lot about the, the mental health aspects of it. What about the physical? Can it lead on to anything else as a result of not being treated? Well, the, the, the other thing that can happen is, um, because she's constantly urinating, uh, the acid can start burning the inside of her legs... Uh, so then there's a burn issue there. So um, then if that doesn't get treated, infections in, in the legs as well. Um, then on top of that, we can have nerve issues, uh, which can result in her problems in walking um, because we, we know in a lot of these countries, the women are the ones who have to walk all the distance to get the water. So now if she's got complications uh, with obstetric fistula. Uh, she's constantly u urinating and the burning sensations down on her legs, she's burnt her legs, she's got nerve damage as well, possibly. Imagine how difficult it is just to go and get some water. The simple thing, like we've got two glasses on the table. And I can imagine, again, if that's not being treated, this can ultimately lead to death. Of course it can. E everything can lead to death. Um, just just uh, any kind of infection, if it's not treated correctly uh, with the right kind of antibiotics or right kind of operation, mm -hmm. uh, can 
can result in, in fatalities. We've talked about the staggering amount of women affected by this. Is there any light at the end of the tunnel here? Is there any hope? Is it something that's actually reducing slightly? Is it staying the same? Or is it maybe, sadly, even growing as a problem? As population grows and as nutrition around the world decreases, um, this problem can only get worse, un un unfortunately. Um, despite all the aid, despite all the help that's going into these places. Despite everything. Uh, and, and, it, and it is quite sad because the aid, the woman's always the last person to eat. And it's, mm -hmm. it's just a fact. Yeah. And, and the viewers will know this uh, from the mothers and from the daughters and so forth. The woman is always the last person. Uh, and being the last person, you always get the scraps. So you're always going to be malnourished. So that much more vulnerable when you're the, actually the most important person to be yeah. well nourished. Yeah, no, exactly. Now, you, we'll talk a little bit now about Physicians Across the Continent, an, an amazing charity that uh, we here at the Islam Channel have uh, been working with for quite some time and have been seeing your work. Mm. Tell me a little bit about, for, the, for those of you who may not be familiar with the charity, tell me a little bit more about who you are and what you do and, and how you came to do what you do. Well, me or the charity? Well, first of all, let's talk about the charity, and then let's talk about you. <laughs> OK. <laughs> uh, the charity uh, was initially um, set up in 2003 uh, by five physicians um, with the problems in Sierra Leone. Uh, Sierra Leone's healthcare system is absolutely virtually finished, uh, basically. So uh, they raised some money amongst themselves, and they, they went out to treat the conditions over there. And then, then they come back. Uh, then there was no concept or no idea of having a charity at all. Uh, and then they were debating, oh, what, we need a name, we need an organisation, we need to grow this because um, we, we've been given a gift. They're doctors, they've been given a gift. Uh, and we have to share our gift and help the people as much as they can. So on the way back from the airport, uh, once, once they landed, uh, the driver, they were talking to the driver and they said, oh, we need a name and so forth. Uh, and the driver said, why don't you call yourself Physicians Across Continents? Uh, and they said, that's brilliant. How'd you come up with that name? And he said, well, when I come to pick you up, I saw a sign called Parcels Across Continents. <laughs> yeah. You lot are doctors. You're working in all these continents around the world. So we changed it like this. Uh, so the name has uh, stuck with us since. So we work in 40 countries around the world. Um, we, we deal with any kind of, and every kind of medical condition someone can have. Uh, be it from tropical diseases, like in Nigeria at the moment, there's a big influx of monkeypox. Uh, so there's no cure for this, so it's education, 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 uh, and trying to not eradicate it, because we cannot, is contain it uh, and understand, understand what it is, and do scientific testing to try and come up with a cure for this. Uh, and then we have uh, general surgeries, uh, children's surgeries, uh, neurosurgery, obviously like you witnessed in Uganda. Um, and then on top of that, it comes down to training as well, uh, be it from the midwife or be it from college students who are training to be doctors and supporting them in the whole education process. Because if we do not do this, and if we just go into a country and we just operate and leave, we haven't left a legacy. I found that that was something I found particularly interesting was the fact that your focus was very much on ensuring that doctors who were coming up through the system yes. in these countries were armed with better education. Of, of course, uh, and I'm going to refer to Uganda because you come with us on the Uganda trip um, and, and the children with hydroclyphalus, uh, the swelling of the head, mm. with how can you put it, a head bigger than mine on, the, on their shoulders, and it's just jelly. And, and what you have to do, uh, you need a neurosurgeon in performing this operation, and in doing so, you have to make an incision in the head, put a catheter in, uh, and put it into the chest. Uh, Uganda haven't got neurosurgeons capable to do this. So what we've done is we had a team over there, and we trained the local doctors in how this procedure happens, the complications of this procedure, because now if, if you put the catheter in too deep, you're going to rupture the brain. Uh, if you don't put it in the right amount, it's not going to drain correctly. 
Yeah. And it's extraordinary. These are all procedures that, I mean, it, it, incredible skill by the mm. surgeons involved. And I certainly don't want to take anything away from that. But these are procedures that we take almost for granted in the West as, you know, anything that happens, you go to the doctor, it's sorted, the surgeons yep. and there's people there. And we, we have no idea the limited resources that these countries have, that the effect that you have as a charity going in is extraordinary. It's, 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 it's twofold. Number one, um, if the can like that, if, if we take um, thyroid gland, uh, uh, goiter gland, um, normally in the, uh, when it's treated in the UK, maximum it will get to is the size of a golf ball. We're dealing with situations the size of a football. Uh, so the doctors in the, in, in the NHS, in private sector, in the, in the UK and, and, and so forth, um, is they're gaining extra skills going to see this. Because if you remove uh, something that big from the neck, you have to take into account uh, the voice receptors, uh, the nerves, the, uh, the veins, um, uh, and the main arteries which are feeding the whole body. So now if you cut one of them, you relatively, you, you've killed the person. Yeah. So it's immense skill level needed. And actually, I'm going to talk, I want to talk a little bit more about the doctors and certainly maybe some cases where particularly you've been dealing with uh, women's health. But just before then, um, the doctors who are all involved with the charity, mm -hmm. um, most of, I think nearly all, all the doctors come uh, from a Muslim background. They all have their faith and the charity has very much about the uh, Islamic faith. Yet you actually treat anybody when you get there. There's, the, the, there's no sort of focusing on, on Muslim communities or anything, you're focusing on just whoever is there who needs help. Of, 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 course, it's, of course it is. Um, uh, colour, creed, nationality, religion, doesn't matter. Uh, Nigeria, the monkeypox uh, condition is affecting mainly uh, the Christian section uh, of Nigeria. It, it doesn't affect us. Uh, we, we have, uh, the organisation is based on Islamic principles, uh, which is clear cut to everyone. You help anyone and everyone which is in need. You can never have enough physicians to go out and do this incredibly valuable work. So how, how do you manage to get more doctors to give up their incredibly valuable time to then go on what is effectively a busman's holiday um, to work incredibly hard yeah. in exceptional conditions? I mean, it, that, that's quite a big ask, isn't it? It is. Um, and so far, they're coming to us. So now, for, for example, now I, I will send one or two doctors away. They will come back. They will speak to their friends who are doctors and surgeons. And they say, look, this is what we've done. This is what we've learned. This is how we're doing it. Uh, and they say, can we come next time? Can we come next time? Because with any kind, anyone in the medical profession, they want to help. And if you give them an opportunity to help, they will jump, jump at the case. And you have doctors from all over, don't you? I from know all, all over the world. Many from, um, you know, well, all, all countries, Every Pakistan, country. Europe, uh, Saudi, I mean, yeah. everywhere. everywhere. It's, it's incredible. And the, the stories, obviously, when you come back and you tell the stories to fellow doctors and show what an impact you've been able mm -hmm. to have, I mean, that's an incredible experience to actually have. Frustrating that you're only having, uh, affecting a small amount of people each time because you physically can only affect a small amount of people. But those, those stories must be amazing. Maybe just give us a bit of an idea of some of those stories, maybe um, particular stories that you're aware of affecting women's health, maybe um, women suffering from fistulas who you've seen and you've seen the, the transformation that's taken place? Like, like for example, a, a lot of the cases with the fistulas is because they've been in isolation for so long or they've had a toy time with rape, um, they're very vulnerable, they're very um, withdrawn and within themselves. Mm. And so like, the first thing we have to do is build their confidence back up. You know, it, it, it's, it's just beautiful the way... The, the people speak to them uh, and treat them as human beings. No, nothing like an outcast. Nothing like you've brought this upon yourself or you've done this. No, it's a condition. It's like any, anyone can get a condition. We'll view the whole situation. Uh, we'll schedule them in for surgery. Is there anybody who stood out maybe in particular as an individual that 
um, the, the, the transformations are all there. They're all vivid, as you've mentioned, and um, have tremendous impact. But is there anybody who particularly stands out for you? I don't like picking one case, to tell the truth, because everyone is individual and everyone has a story. And we could, we could sit here till, what's the saying? Cows come in? Yep, till cows yeah, come yeah, home. Yeah. We, we, we could we're sit speaking in. to a farmer's son, so I completely understand that. Okay, that's, that's <laughs> brilliant. Uh, we, we, we could sit from, from the countries that we've been to, be it the fistula campaign that we've done in Pakistan. Uh, again, um, that, that was... <laughs> they're, they're stuck in a room. Seriously, Alistair, all these women... Um, if you, if you imagine like uh, a, a school gym, uh, they've got mattresses on the floor, and, and they're just left there. Mm. You know, and the doctors go in, and it's like you, you can see it in some of the people's faces that they go in and they go, "Oh, it smells. It's this. We're not going to go in this room." You know, and the, the, these guys go there, and you empower the woman again. Yeah. You, you speak to her, and you say, "Look, there is life after this." It's a problem. We'll fix it. Now, you're head of PAC in the UK, and you're talking yes. there about stories and the power of stories. What about your story? How did you get involved with PAC? And give us an idea of some of the experiences that you've had and the things that keep motivating you to keep on doing this exceptional work. Well, um, I, I, I came here to have a meeting um, uh, with Muhammad Ali, CEO of the channel, yep. uh, and he said, Khalid, what are you doing now? And I said, I'm just relaxed, taking easy for a little while. Uh, and he went, oh, do you want to get back into charity? I went, Mohammed, I've been doing it for 15, 16 years. I need a break. He went, I've got some people I think you should meet. I went, all right, I've known you for so long. I'll, 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 I'll meet them. And he said, good, they're outside. And I thought, <laughs> you stitched me up on this one. <laughs> So, so I met, I met um, Dr. Jamal, who's one of the trustees, Dr. Saad as well, and Abdul Karim, another trustee. And we had a discussion. Uh, and I was like, do I really want to get back into charity? And then they told me about the case. And it's ironically, it's, it's the case when you kept running out of the operating theatre of the lady that come in with an autopic pregnancy. I didn't know what an autopic pregnancy mm -hmm. was then. Um... And like the whole situation and so forth, and what they do uh, over there to save the woman's life, and I thought to myself, I did give it a go, try it, see what, see the situation, um, because the doctors are doing their bit. They're literally saving lives. And what are you doing in your day-to-day -day work? Um, because obviously I know you've been out to the, to the countries you've mm -hmm. seen for yourself, which obviously is a really important part of raising the profile of the charity back here in the UK. But what, how do you see your role? What, what's, what are the most important parts of it? It's most many things, really. Uh, number one is, is to build the foundation of this organisation, um, is, is to build a structure that, if I'm gone tomorrow, everything still continues, and it's fundamental on, on that side. And it's to secure enough funding that we can benefit as many people as we can globally. Um, in, in the UK, we're doing some projects internationally, obviously working in 40 countries. Um, but if we can build something collectively, we literally can save lives. And as you say, it's, it's, it's uh, using all of the Islamic principles to make sure that it's just providing a, a, a positive ray of light for so many people who don't have access to the resources that we have here in, in Britain that we often take for granted. Of, of, of course. Now, um, obviously, we know the situation which is happening in Bangladesh and Cox's Bazaar in the Akan region. Uh, so we, we've set up uh, a medical camp there. Um, we're treating on average 100 people a day, um, literally coming in. Uh, and like the lady I was telling you with mm -hmm. uh, early on with the black eye and, and the foot, she come to us and then the team is going to be flying out in a few weeks and she's put on the list for an orthopedic um, op op operation. Um, and that's completely free, completely free. Uh, Uganda, we go there uh, many times. Sierra Leone, 
Um, and th this is something I've never been able to say, being in the whole sector for my whole time. In Sierra Leone in August, uh, when they had the mudslides, um, I've never been able to say I've helped every single person affected by one condition or one natural disaster. But when we sent a team of nine doctors, every single person who was affected by that mudslide, our team helped, be it medication. There was one woman, and this is unfortunate, she, 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 she was heavily pregnant and she had twins. Um, it, there, there was a severe miscarriage, uh, but we, we treated her. Uh, it's, it's very sad. Uh, the children were severely um, scared to go back into a building. Mm. Um, so we had one of our professors, uh, and she's from Sudan. Uh, she, she's, she's a child specialist. She's a psychologist and also a pediatric surgeon. And the thing she was doing with the kids is like taking their minds off it. Uh, and we, we were sitting there going, okay, you're having fun and games with these kids. But then after, she said, Khalid, that person, that person, that person, that person, we need to assess them more. That's, that's what they see. Yeah. As, as Dr. Jamal said, um, when, when you see someone having a, a, an epileptic fit, uh, being a medic, we will see someone shaking on the floor. That's what we would see. Uh, but you need to see how they're shaking. Yeah. Where is their tongue? What is their head doing? What are their hands doing? Then you can determine what kind of seizure the person is having. Mm -hmm. Then once we can determine quickly what kind of seizure that person's having, we can implement a cure. Quicker. Now, obviously, a big part of what you do is it, it's expensive. You know, I know you get donations of, of drugs and medical supplies. Um, the physicians themselves give up their own time, but it still requires a lot of money. And I know that if anybody wants to, they can get hold of us at the channel and find out more about you and um, donate and, and help this incredible work. Because you're quite different from many of the charities that go out there, aren't you? In terms of, you know, we've talked quite a bit about it, but this level of education that you you give and yeah. I like the fact that you used the word earlier on of legacy we, we leave a legacy um, because and I'm not being disrespectful to any organization everyone does a fantastic job um, but all, all we re really do we're just specialists in one field in medical medical training um, disease control it's just anything medical related that's what that's relatively what we do so I, I wouldn't be doing uh, well. I, actually, when the children come to us in hospital, we do feed them, mm. uh, but we, we, we won't be going out to deliver food parcels and so forth, because when I come back from Bangladesh, uh, we, we saw many many people, and they need a simple operation. It's a, st a stint in the heart, uh, and over there, the actual stint ranges from up to fifteen hundred dollars, basically, for, for a stint. To put in heart, that's one. And then uh, the actual price for the procedure is another $1,500. You look at $3,000 for one operation. Um, but now, if we can go there and we can do this operation, the, the, the individual doesn't need the food parcel anymore because mm -hmm. they get their self-dignity back. They get, they get their life back. They can go and work. They can uh, provide for the family. They can reinvest in the economy of the country. So what you're doing by providing one operation, you're helping an individual, yes. You're saving his life, yes. You're helping his family. You're taking him out of poverty because he will go out and he will work. Uh, and, and, and having seen the work that you do firsthand, I can absolutely uh, tell you that it's remarkable the impact that you're actually having in these countries mm. and the work that you're doing is phenomenal. And I hope that people will continue to contribute, whether it be time, whether it be money or resources. But uh, thank you so much indeed for coming in. Thank you for having uh, me today. Telling us more about it today and the effect particularly it's having on women. Uh, but unfortunately, that is all we have time for today. Uh, I'd like to thank our guest again, uh, Khalid Javid, for coming in and sharing his experiences, those amazing stories and for coming onto the show as well. Once again, we must stress that should you suffer from any medical problems or health concerns, it's always highly recommended that you contact your doctor or GP as the health show gives you an alternative viewpoint to the health concern being discussed. If you'd like to find out more about this, the charity or any of the topics that we've discussed on this or any of our shows, please do get in touch with us, healthshow at islamchannel.tv. But for now, it's goodbye from me. Thank you for joining us and see you again next week.
Assalamu alaikum.